very stimulating uh, contribution and um, we would say that the debate is certainly relatively open as to the historical um, legacy of uh, 1916. The next speaker will be Comment of Rada, a professor at the School of Economics in uh, UCD, uh, the author of a number of books, um, some that I read a long time ago, um, The Great Irish Famine and others. Um, uh, Probably will not be a stranger to all of those who are students of history, um, whether either economic or political. Um, it's a pleasure to have called on. Just a couple of points from what Relation to what it said. I mean, arguments about the past and the reality are about arguments of the future, about the future. And we do live in an era of commodification of all aspects of people's lives, whether it be human needs, human relationships. All those have come, now come, come commodified. And it's interesting, uh, the task organization produced a, a report there on democracy in Ireland. And the majority of the Irish people found it actually from far more important to get better, better support, constant equality, found far better support among the people on economic issues. So the indication actually that in body of the people, of Irish, Irish people, there is a great sense of frustration, a great sense of wanting a difference, wanting something different. And the concept of equality was very high up the agenda, far more up the agenda than what the politicians would like to believe. So just for those words, call them common to you. Sinn Féin, of course, was what uh, we would see as economic 
convergence uh, in the sense that uh, living standards, or the gap in living standards between Britain and Ireland uh, is narrow. Now, I take this from a paper by uh, somebody who teaches in this institution, Kevin O'Rourke, which uh, gives you um, uh, an informed guess at what was happening to uh, GDP in Ireland relative to uh, Britain and also uh, wages. And you'll see that this is this is for the pre-independence period. You'll see that in this period there is convergence. Now it's at the expense of course of massive uh, uh, population loss I mean, uh, because people leave the labour market and hold is higher and wages rise. Uh, even that statement is contentious and uh, I, I, I would defend it uh, later if need be. Anyway, you have here some convergence. Um, after independence, uh, the story is uh, different. Um, there is, this is again in terms of per capita income or GDP, there is divergence uh, in the 20s and 30s, and, and then it's only recently that you have very impressive convergence. And there's some convergence from the 60s on, but uh, so-called Celtic Tiger era, of course, is what's um, uh, really uh, uh, driving uh, the convergence here. Uh, so, for most of the period of independence, the, the achievement uh, is, is really not that impressive. And uh, I think that this is, in our part, the economic policies uh, pursued were wrong, and to some extent they were uh, true to the aspirations are the, not aspirations, but uh, means suggested by uh, Sinn Féin nationalists of uh, the pre-1916-1920 uh, period. Now, one aspect, of course, which was associated very much with the uh, post-1932 is uh, import substitute and industrialization. And in the context of the 1930s, this did not seem, perhaps, uh, that unusual or that crazy because lots of other uh, new fledgling economies were trying as well. Um, this was also at a time of considerable unemployment and in the short run, industrialization is a way of uh, uh, increasing jobs. But the point is that ISI for short was running out of steam before that world. <coughs> uh, it was not a program that would lead to continued economic growth. And of course, this is confused by uh, World War II. But what World War II, I think, showed, or should have shown, is that autarky, in other words, being closed in, uh, uh, an economy which uh, <coughs> tries to live off its own resources entirely, was disastrous uh, in uh, economic terms. And Europe, I think, economically, or sorry, economies go, it is true that our sport here of Iron and Lena. Uh, and the, the economies is kind of basic economics, the economies have a lot to do. Uh, there is mutual gain from trade of goods and people and so on. And uh, perhaps this is a message that economic nationalism doesn't take on board uh, enough. And uh, uh, two countries trading together does not have to be one exploiting the other. I mean, there are mutual gains to be got from this. I think too much of the rhetoric is in terms of trade is exploitation. Uh, the economists are more comfortable with knowing that trade is mutual gain. Both parties have something to gain. And uh, I think um, during World War II, uh, the option of trading simply wasn't there. And uh, as a result, uh, the economy uh, was in, uh, in, in, in dire strait. So the problem is that the lesson was embarrassed. If ISI didn't exactly do the cost in the 30s, the problem was that we did not liberalize uh, and continue ISI uh, after 1949 and up to uh, the late 50s and the early 60s. And the cost of that, in terms of growth, of economic growth, in terms of economic welfare foregone, was, I believe, enormous. Um, now, we can learn something from looking at the, other, the experience of other neutral countries during World War II. And I have a few graphs here uh, concerning Switzerland and Sweden. And in both those cases, uh, the 
share of um, trade, imports and exports in output, dropped heavily during World War II. You can see that that sort of dip here in all these graphs is telling you. Uh, these are countries which would have exported to Britain and France and elsewhere during World War II. They are forced to uh, trade with Germany. <coughs> Um, and this here is what happens in Sweden. The Swedish economy declines during World War II, then picks. But over the period as a whole, it uh, uh, does poorly. Um, this is what happens to Swedish and Swiss trade with Germany. It's artificially high because they don't have the choice of trading with countries that they would have preferred to trade with. And the result of that is that these countries like Ireland, suffer severely. Ireland had no choice but to trade with Britain uh, during World War II. And the British, quite understandably in their own interest, bought cheap and sold dear because they were both monopolists selling to us and they were what the economists call monopsonists in buying from us. So they would say to uh, Irish exporters of butter and meat and so on, well, if you don't like our price, that's too bad. And, uh, but the consequences economically were um, this, that the terms of trade, in other words, the price of Irish exports, the terms of price of imports, plummets during World War II. Um, as far as social conditions go, I mean, we think of the emergency as a heroic period in uh, 20th century Irish economic history. There is a sense in which there was a good deal of social cohesiveness. Uh, and uh, that, is, that was, a, you know, admirable. But living standards dropped, and a very sensitive indication of this is what happens to infant mortality. Um, infant mortality here, this is for Dublin, the pink is Dublin, the rest is for the country as a whole. Infant mortality rose significantly during uh, World War II. And that is uh, uh, a very sensitive measure of um, living conditions. Uh, as far as national income is concerned, it's lack of best, it drops a little. Investment plummets. So the capital stock of the economy is run down during World War II. Machinery uh, is not replaced. And uh, this is all uh, forced on the economy by autarky, by self-sufficiency. So we have this kind of natural experiment, as it were, in self-sufficiency. It's as close as the Irish economy ever got to self-sufficiency. And it exacted a huge price in terms of living standards. Now, subsequently, we caught up <coughs> famously at one uh, 1987. Uh, uh, and we, uh, I, I know we have to be careful about we, because uh, you know, that means an average and a raise the questions about who benefits most and who doesn't benefit very much. But uh, let's stick to the shorthand of we. Um, but what I, what, what I want to do in, in talking about us since 1950 is to compare the Irish economy and the Italian economy. And it's a useful comparison because both start off in 1950 at the same level of national income per head. Living standards in Ireland and Italy are very similar in 1950. And they're also very similar in year 2000. So if you're talking about two economies who take different routes uh, from mid-century to the end of the century. Uh, so I've written a little paper about this, which isn't uh, published yet, and it's like if you take the high road and I take the, the low road. And does it really matter? Is all that matters that you end up at the same point in terms of living standards? And uh, I I think not. So it's not just the GDP per head uh, is the same in mid-century and, and now, uh, but population change over the period is also uh, roughly the same. The Italian population rose by proportionally the same amount between 1950 and 2000 as ours did. So I suppose if you compare countries from a present day or a presentist perspective, then you would say the Italian economy is a basket case and the Irish economy is a recording success. And I, I do this by comparing 
you know, the covers of uh, economist uh, magazines that refer to Ireland. This is in 2004. This is in 1997. Uh, panel referred to uh, the way in which outsiders have been saying that uh, a lot can be learned from the Irish experience, I think, in a way that is disputable. But, um, so you look at that uh, in by the cars. Uh, this is a very recent thing. And uh, this is just, just a few years ago. Uh, now, if you're talking about two economies, like I say, with uh, <coughs> similar uh, living standards, except now the Irish economy is doing well, the Italian economy is doing poorly. But this is, roughly speaking, what happens uh, over the preceding half century. They, they, they start off together here uh, and around three and a half thousand uh, ninety ninety dollars per head and then they end up and by now the Irish economy is taking over overtaking the Italians in terms of GDP per head per uh, but does it matter which route one, one takes? And the, the, the economist's answer is no it does not. The Italian route is far preferable. Because over this period, Italians on average draw, uh, enjoy much higher living standards than Irish people. They're the same at the beginning and the end, but in the meantime, Italians on average draw, uh, enjoy living standards which are about a fifth or a fourth or higher than Irish people. Um, Does that happen to social services? You, no, no, this is just what you think. Good, good. Yeah. And, and again, uh, Italian achievement in terms of uh, maintaining a higher population on average is superior. Because what happened in Ireland, of course, is that there are two periods of population decline, uh, famously in the, in the 50s and then again uh, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and uh, in between, you get rapid population growth in the 1970s and again uh, currently. But on average, over the period, the Italian population is a good deal higher. So the Italian economy is managing not only a higher living standard per head, but it's managing to sustain a far higher population on average during this half century. So it does matter uh, how you move from A to B. And uh, the Italian way of doing it, uh, I think, was in terms of delivering on uh, well-being, on economic well-being, was uh, the superior one. And I think that is because it pursued uh, an old, more open uh, economic policy. Um, this early period here between 1950 and the 60s, of course, uh, was associated with a continuation <coughs> of the ISI, Import Substitute Industrialization Policy of the 1930s. And then uh, in the 1970s, of course, uh, and in the early 1980s, the economy suffers from uh, poor policy making. Uh, and I mean, this, uh, there is an extent to which the, the boom uh, after 1987 is simply making up for the damages that have been inflicted earlier. You know? uh, so uh, where we are now, where we would have been, anyway, and, and we would probably have got there at uh, less expense in terms of social welfare had we not made the mistakes we have made earlier. So had we been more like the Italians, more open uh, in the 50s and in the early 60s, had we not kind of um, kicked all these economic policy old goals in the late 70s up to the late 80s, then we would have gone the higher road rather than the lower road. We would have ended up more or less where we are anyway. Uh, but in between, people would have enjoyed far less unemployment, far higher living standards. Uh, the, project, the demographic tra trajectory would have been better. So I see what happened initially as a kind of might have been, but uh, economic historians refer to as a kind of faction. Had economic, economic policy been more enlightened, uh, we could have gone that route, we didn't. Uh, and I think that puts. Uh, our, our achievements uh, and the Celtic tiger have been in a very different light because a lot of it is really about delayed convergence. It's about making up for the mistakes that have been made previously. And of course, I would put some of those mistakes down to what I call the beginning, Sinn Féin economics. 
Um, now, so this is another way of telling the same story which I won't, I, I won't uh, dwell on. Now, there are other ways in which uh, we have uh, become better off, which uh, the national accounts uh, do not tell us about. And um, this, is, this is one, I, I suppose, uh, which uh, will become maybe even more important. <coughs> uh, not only have we been enjoying higher living standards on average, but we have been putting in far fewer hours of work in order to uh, enjoy that affluence. Uh, now, this the comparison here between the Irish and the Dutch uh, suggests that the Dutch have gone farther uh, along that particular road than we have. Uh, and uh, the US are famously workaholics compared to lots of European uh, populations. Um, but um, now, this is another <coughs> angle, uh, uh, which I think um, <clears throat> should not be overlooked when we talk about increasing affluence. Uh, I suppose ultimately the idea of uh, economic affluence is, is to make people happier, uh, to make people less worried about uh, their security and their future and so on in the material sense, the cultural and spiritual sense, something else. But uh, this gives you, uh, well, the, the euro around survey of uh, the populations of uh, member states of the common market of the European Union. Uh, there are data for Ireland, of course, back from 1973. And what this shows is that, uh, slightly worryingly, is that for most of the period, uh, up to very recently, uh, the proportion of Irish people themselves very happy has not gone up or anything is tended to drop. Um, now, there is always here, of course, an argument about uh, whether you could compare countries because the Danes always come out of this as blissfully happy. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I know Denmark fairly well, I don't know on average, are they, are they really, uh, or whether their definition of happiness whether the word for happiness in Danish means something different. Uh, on the other hand, the French and the Italian, about 20%, are almost suicide. Always. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is something there, <coughs> there is, but that, that is in making cross-section comparisons. In making comparisons over time, I think, this does give us uh, some time for pause. And, Maybe when economies are changing very, very rapidly and when values are changing very, very rapidly, this does worry some people and make some unhappy, and maybe that is, that is what's going on. Now, it has to be said, in the last few years, um, Eurobarometer is telling a somewhat more uh, upbeat uh, story about uh, conditions in Ireland. And these data here appear in 2003. And the satisfaction mean here, I won't go into details of how that's calculated as happiness mean. And um, it's actually not that bad. And, uh, and then this again, these are the last latest data we have optimism about the future. 32% uh, are optimistic, 51% uh, agree somewhat. Um, and but look again at the Danes, optimism about the future, 51% agree completely. Uh, whereas in Germany and in France, they're talking about 8%. Um, anyway, um, I, I think I'd like to end by making a few uh, remarks about uh, North and South. Um, I don't think it's often realized that a century ago the population of Belfast was bigger than the population of uh, Dublin. And that's including middle class countries. Uh, and of course one thinks in terms of the Titanic and in terms of Denopolis and compares that to uh, Guinness and Jacobs. And the point is that the Industrial Revolution passed uh, Dublin uh, by. Now this of course is a reminder of another point uh, in that uh, Sinn Féin economics seem to superficially anyway, suit the South much better than the North. It would be difficult to argue that uh, 
uh, union within the United Kingdom did not benefit uh, the northeastern part of the island. In the northeastern part of the island uh, went through uh, uh, an industrial revolution which was far reaching and uh, which you know made it a world leader uh, in uh, uh, 1914. At that time, of course, the Titanic was the biggest uh, ship in the world. Uh, Belfast was the biggest rope making factory in the world. Uh, Belfast produced more linen than the rest of Europe put together. You know? and so there is a sense in which Ireland benefited. Uh, and there is again this disjuncture between uh, claims that um, Ireland suffered from the Union and the obvious sense in which the Union benefited at all. And of course this is having to lead to, uh, this in, uh, lead to issues of uneven, uneven development and you have back in the 1970s those armed Marxists who argued that uh, partition was the product of uneven development. And I don't want to argue that but just to put it in, in, in this context. Uh, I mean by that reckoning of course uh, Northern Unionists now would be dying to join the South because the southern economy at this stage is, uh, I, so I, I think both now and then uh, this, this kind of argument is passed out. Um, if you look at uh, population, again this brings us back to uh, where we started, uh, the uh, Republic's share of the island population dropped up to uh, 1971, 1981. Um, and since then it's been getting back uh, to where it was at the outset. So again, you have, in comparing north and south, using this, uh, you know, uh, uh, gauge, what this suggests is that the, you know, the southern economy did worse under independence than the northern economy did by remaining uh, within the union. That's one crude way of. Uh, and of course, uh, there were uh, those in uh, the north who uh, very much felt this way. This is a, a, a cartoon that was produced. In Belfast periodical in uh, the late 1940s. Poor um, Southern agricultural labor only wishing he could uh, earn the high wages uh, that uh, were available in the Black North. Uh, now, if you look at uh, Northern Ireland within the UK, uh, then uh, as far as how is concerned, the graph is flat. But then there are all these transfers, which mean that if you look at personal income, uh, the North has been converging with uh, Great Britain. Um, now, um, if you use the same kind of measures uh, comparing North and South, of course, uh, Southern income per head has gone way beyond northern income by now. Uh, so uh, there is a sense in which using national accounts, the north now is more backward than the south. No question about that. But in terms of living standards, I'm not so sure. And uh, this hasn't, I don't, to my knowledge, this hasn't been done very carefully. But if you use just one gauge, it's a very crude gauge, and um, any economist would tell you that. But if you look at power ownership, as something that people aspire to. Uh, uh, then obviously there has been a narrowing of the gap between North and South. But car ownership density is still higher in Northern, in Northern Ireland than it is down here. Uh, I'd say if you're from a housing quality, uh, on average housing quality is still probably better north of the border than it is down here. Uh, but you know, I wouldn't like us to crow too much uh, in the South about the, the our regime. We certainly have caught up, uh, but I argue that having a caught up with Italy raises issues. Uh, in terms of national accounting, we have caught up uh, with the North. I'm not so sure, I suppose, we have caught up in any standards in the sense that if you look at my migration again, and uh, this is something I mentioned at the earlier, there are more people from the North working down here than vice versa. Uh, so, you know, you could say that is, that is telling you something about living standards and uh, the labor market. So uh, finally, this is the last issue uh, about you know, does or did the border matter very much? Uh, and there are various ways of looking at this. One is 
uh, what would uh, the island economy be without the border? Would there be more trade? Would there be more uh, migration? Would there be people from the south settling in the north and vice versa? So one possibility is the kind of the uh, counterfactual of there be no border whatsoever. And another is, is the north and south border like other borders? In other words, um, is there less trade across our border than there is, say, across the border between Belgium and Holland, or the border between uh, France and Germany? That kind of question. So does the border uh, artificially limit trade more than one might expect? And one can look at trade migration, and also one can ask how has living near the border impacted on uh, people on both sides? Now, the first thing is that Northern Ireland uh, trade as a percentage of trade down here has diminished a lot. Uh, as far as migration, there is a border effect. You know, the imposition of the border in uh, the 1920-21-22 uh, has an effect on Northern Ireland residents uh, of border counties in the south. And then there are some blips here. Uh, obviously, uh, as a result of the 1970s and the burning of Catholic streets and so on, and people moving south. So that's what you get here. Some of them go back. And then you have the impact of the Celtic Tiger. And the impact of the Celtic Tiger is more dramatic in terms of the movement of people from north to south than anything else. That's, that's what you're getting into. Um, let me skip that. Um, this, this, I think this is the second last, or third last slide. Um, I am not sure that getting rid of the border would result in a massive increase in trade north-south or in uh, migration north-south. I think that uh, the border uh, doesn't impact on economic activity very much. Um, and that south-south trade and south-south movement is much more important. So what you have here is looking at Belfast Dublin railway traffic compared to Cork Dublin uh, traffic uh, between 1990 and 1990. And, you know, Cork Dublin is much more important than... Uh, and I think, and this is going way back in history, I think this is uh, a product of um, developments which aren't preceded any talk about a partition. It goes back to uh, the 17th century or the 18th century, maybe. And that is that so much trade in Ireland started with the East, West, Rock, and North South. This is a map that was produced in, as you can see there, in 1837 for a commission that was deciding on what Irish railway network might make sense. So what was done at the time, and this was a very revolutionary map of the time, it's a map of freight traffic within Ireland in the pre-railway age. And you see there's very, very little between Dublin and Belfast. All the traffic is uh, east-west. And indeed, uh, the railway commissioner said, well, you might want to open a railway between Dublin and Belfast, but you can be very sure that it's going to lose a lot of money. It's not going to be economic. Uh, and it's going to cut across an awful lot of uh, trade which naturally goes east-west. So, you know, the notion, uh, and of course there are some, like, uh, intra-trade Ireland would obviously argue that there is all this untapped trade between north and south there that would result from uh, greater harmony and uh, what have you. I'm not so sure to say, but this is a skeptical kind of a note of an economist. Uh, finally, on the Tiger, we have moved from, this is my shorthand, from ISI to ESI, from import substituting uh, industrialization to export subsidizing industrialization. Uh, it has worked. I mean, it, it, it brings its own contradictions. But in terms of delivering the goods, in terms of increasing living standards, in allowing the country for the, you know, the first time in decades to maintain a big population 
return Ireland from a country of emigrants to a country of immigrants, the Celtic Tiger has delivered for all that. I mean, this is indisputable. Um, it's also true that the benefits of size, I started off with uh, no economy is an island. And what I mean by that is that the costs of all traffic, particularly if you're very small, are huge. On the other hand, the benefits of size uh, fall with the degree of openness. So being a small economy uh, is not such a disadvantage if you pursue uh, open uh, economic policies. It's also true that recent economic growth has consisted of more than catch-up. Catch-up has been an important part of it, but there's more going on. Now, I think we should focus, however, more on GNP over population rather than GDP. We now seem to be pursuing economic growth for its own sake. And uh, the kind of the holy grail is bigger and bigger and bigger GDP. We should instead look at GNP rather than GDP, because GDP is very much inflated by the profits of multinationals. You know, it's, it's artificially inflated, but nevertheless it's inflated. So when we're making comparisons with other countries, including Italy, we should be comparing Irish GNP and Italian GDP. And also, uh, we should be interested more in living standards now than in how big the economy is per se. So we should focus on GNP and have a population uh, rather than simply GDP. There is also the point that uh, we are going through a phase of increasing inequality. Um, <coughs> this is a global phenomenon, but there are some countries uh, which uh, bump the trend. And I think there is, for that reason, no need for complacency. Um, this is taken from uh, a working paper by a colleague in the SRI. Uh, it's the best we can do in terms of tracking uh, the share of the top 1% to the top half percent uh, of uh, people in total income. And you see, uh, between 38, which is the first we can get, up to uh, the 1980s, the tendency was for a fall. And this, again, is something that other countries experienced as well. But since then, there has tended to be an increase in uh, inequality by uh, this uh, measure. Now, th these are my, my final thoughts. Uh, the economist uh, and uh, philosopher, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, long ago distinguished between what he called the laws of production and the laws of distribution. Now, we can do very little about the first, because they are determined by climate and weather and geography and technology. You know, you can't draw blood out of a stone. There's only, you know, so much energy you can get out of a ton of coal. These are the laws of production. The laws of distribution, uh, I think, uh, politics, these, these are more the stuff of politics, and we can uh, do uh, more about it. So, like, in the, in the spirit of the, the proclamation, I would like to see more focus on policies that uh, reduce inequality, to foster a sense of community. And uh, again, I mean, I have a draw for uh, things like uh, hurling and the Irish language and so on, and uh, maybe indefinable uh, cultural things, and uh, I, I think those are also uh, worth um, um, pursuing. But we're back to where I, I started. I think uh, Sinn Féin economics is not going to bring us uh, those. I, I'm using Sinn Féin, don't want to sound derogatory, but I'm using Sinn Féin economics in a technical sense of pursuing self-sufficiency, uh, believing that trade is bad, uh, and, and, and so on. So, Sinn Féin, for now.